in this video, I'll be showing some key techniques used to create these stylized concrete tiles. I'll be explaining my tiling approaches, how to make these brush based surfaces that look hand painted, and how we can create corner edge highlights, as well as the moss elements too. An SBS will also be available if you're curious about anything not covered here. When it comes to creating a patterned layout, should it be bricks, planks, tiles, etc., there are two methods I generally use with the tile sampler, either those with a non-custom input or a custom one. So for example, this tile sampler doesn't have a custom input. It just uses a square or a brick. And we've got these cracks that I've just really quickly made just as a example and typically you get something like this where generally some tiles it looks good like it feels natural and like a good composition and then other places it's just too much noise so for photo reel that can be quite nice and natural but for stylized where you really have less, or should I say fewer and larger details such as these, you really want them to be controlled and look good. The way I do that is usually the custom, using custom inputs into the tile sampler. And that's where I'm just manually placing my cracks. So, the first tile doesn't have any, then I've got this that just goes there, and then I've got like a nice break here, and then one where we've got different cracks on the tile on the corners. And then that's being plugged into a tile sampler. And by default, the symmetry random is at zero. And this is resulting in these cracks, these tiles being placed out on exactly the same rotation each time. By putting this up to one, you just ensure that they're all individually rotated by increments of 90 degrees. The other aspects of the tile sampler that you'll want to look at is the pattern distribution. This is here. So by default, this is set to random. And as you can see here, there's just too many cracks that are showing up. The mask random, if you start dropping them, then it just completely kills the tiles. So what you can do is the use the pattern distribution and use a, just a parallel noise will do. And then add a levels. This will give you quite a bit of control. So if we just take a look at this and manipulate the levels, you can see that we can bring them in and out, kind of like how we would expect a random mask to work if it was just for the cracks. This is why custom shapes can be especially useful for stylized materials because you have more precise control. So here I am dictating where the cracks would go. Between that and experimenting with the random seed to get different results, you should be able to find a good composition. This technique of course can be used with a variety of needs such as split ends of wood or bolts, chips off corners, etc. To really help your materials feel stylized, you'll want to consider incorporating brush strokes into your base surfaces. This first video will show a quick method to achieve this effect, and as we go through the videos, I'll show increasingly more complex approaches. Before that, I quickly want to show you one of my favorite noise maps, the Fractual Sun Base. Now, the Clouds 2 is really great, and I use it a lot but it only really has one parameter that's useful, and that's the, the scale. With the fractal sum base, however, you've got four, and with this, I've just got a lot more 
variation in the types of noises that I get. And I can quickly get to what I need. So back to the brush surfacing, we can use a crystal too. I like this as there is a lot of directionality to the noise and in multiple directions. I personally do find it a bit too vertical. So I like to often use a transform 2D and squash it by 50% in the height. And then that just makes it more a global vertical and horizontal kind of directionality to it. So then you would plug this into a slope blur, like we've got the same setup here and we've plugged it into a slope blur grayscale. And with a fractal sum base, we're able to get a fed like this. And if we offset it with a directional warp and so on, we get this brushy effect. And this is quite a quick way of doing this. If I'm making a brush surface for smaller details, I find that this is often enough for what I need. Next, I want to talk about the gradient map. Now you can see here that I have a auto levels before plugging in the brush base. And I often use a auto levels because if I bring in another gradient map here and we have two contrasting colors, let's pick more colors, green, blue. And if I plug in the auto level version, notice that you get, you get blue, green, red. However, if we place it in before the auto levels, there's much less range of color in there. So I like to typically add auto levels just before anything goes into a gradient map, just to ensure I get the full range. Now, this is what I ended up with, and I found this too noisy. So what I've done is picked a similar color and created this mask here. This is just a rotated version, just to ensure that it doesn't line up correctly with the underlying brush strokes. I'm just adding this on top with a copy. So this is it without, and this is it with. Now, you might be wondering why I just don't use a normal uniform color here, right? So we could just do this and it would be exactly the same. But if later we go back and we were to change the color scheme of this for whatever reason, say we made it blue and then we plug this in, you're going to get this color on top, which no longer works with the color before. So this is just a trick where I set the, so it's just a transform 2D. And then going into the MIP map mode, I turn it to manual and then just ramp this up and it approximates the average color. And now I can just plug this in here. Or even if we were to do this one, right? Just to show you. So this way it just keeps your average color so that if you do make color scheme changes later, it will still update this node. Also with the gradient map, you often see, especially in photo real tutorials, you'll see this where they bring up the gradient editor and do the pick gradient on usually a photo. So imagine this is a photo, but this results in a lot of pickers, which is good for photo real because it's adding a lot of variation, which is more natural, but with stylized materials, you really don't want that much to mess around with. To be honest, like I rarely have more than six pickers and doing this just gives me a lot more control over my values, something like this. So I'll be showing a few different methods for edge highlights over the course of these videos. 
Typically, they involve taking information from the height up, converting that into a height and then a curve just move. But for now, let's take a look at a more manual approach that is especially useful for materials such as these tiles. To start this process, we find a mask for the main pattern that we have, in this case, these concrete tiles. And that goes into a blur HQ grayscale. And then that goes into the background and opacity. And this creates a sort of outline. And we can create a highlight. So just to show you what's going on here, I'm going to just pick a very simple shape, such as a square. And let's use that as the mask. And this will go here. So it's blurring this, it's creating a outline, and then it's being put on. If you multiply, it becomes a highlight that you can control the distance with the blur. However, if you change this to a subtract, it becomes more like a shadow. In this case, we're going to use a multiply and the original mask, of course. So after that, I'm just clamping it with levels, giving it more contrast. And then I'm using just a flood fill with angle variation and multiplying that on top just so that it gives a sense of direction on these tiles. And then again, just clamping it down to get these more thinner, stronger shapes. Then just to make that feel a little more natural and brushed, we can add a crystal too, and just use our really quick method of using a slope blur. If you don't use this blur, you might get like little things like this. So just add an extra blur can sometimes just help get rid of those. And then again, just a levels just to really clamp it. And then that's just being plugged into at the end of the albedo with just a flat color or actually no, in this case, we took this like an older version and just made it much lighter. Because that's more interesting than just a completely flat value. If you've got the time, it's worth doing things like that. And so we've got this mask that we made just now into the opacity and that's being overlaid on top. So this is it with the highlights. This is without it. And back again. So for the moss, we want the moss to be coming out of the crevices and the cracks and so on. So if we go earlier on in our height map, we've got a mask here, if we invert it, that's showing all the cracks and crevices. You can always use a slope blur to push outwards, whatever you're plugging into it, if you use it with a blurred version of the same input. So to show that, I'll just be dropping this intensity down. So it's like this, and then it's just a nice way to push out your shapes. This causes some artifacts in some cases. So I just use the non-uniform blur to give it a bit more shape and smooth those out a little. And then another slope blur just to play around with the distortion of it so that it's a bit more organic. And then this is just being added with a moisture noise, just to give it a little bit of texture into the moss. If you look closely here, you can kind of see that going on. And the whiter parts of these of this map is where it's going to be coming through first if we use it with a height blend. Now, typically a height blend, you kind of want the contrast to be one, but in cases like this where it's coming through and you kind of want it to be like staining the surrounding areas, it can be useful to drop the contrast just a tiny bit to get some fall off. 
So this is it without the fall off and then with. So just a little bit there can be kind of interesting. And then this is it without. And as you can see, the white parts, as I just explained, come through first, which is exactly what we need in this case. To add some extra mustains, I'm going to use the height mask on the height blend and plug that into a shadows. And we can adjust the size of the shadow with the shadow distance. And then with a slope blur, add in a crystal two again, just to make it feel brushy. And then plugging that into the albedo. Now the albedo for the moss, again, just note, like I said before, it doesn't need that many color inputs. I just added a darkened version of that by plugging in a HSL with lightness lowered. And by using that mask, we made sure that the stains are coming off from the source of the moss, which is in the cracks and crevices. Those were some of the techniques used to create this material. As we go through these videos, I'll be showing many new techniques as well as alternatives to some of the methods shown here. In the next video, we'll be looking into techniques to help create stylized wood materials.